Hi, and welcome back. This is Teresa Gonzalez with Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Please subscribe through our website, latinasb2b.com, and like and subscribe us through your podcast platforms. Buckle up for this episode as we are about to serve the tea on tech here in the Bay Area. Okay, a quick shout out to those of you who are engaging with us on IG and Twitter. Thanks for sending us your feedback and support. We really appreciate it. So let's get right to it. All right, so welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. And this is the podcast that I have been waiting to talk about for so long, and it is regarding tech and toxicity. And today I have a few wonderful, awesome women that will be joining me in a conversation around this topic. We've all been together in the tech industry, and we have all experienced and have acknowledged that the tech industry has to change. So I'd like to welcome Nicole Rivera, who is a civic engagement activist, and I know her, and she is awesome. (laughs) And then I also have Daisy Ozum, who is a tech equity activist, and she also has her startup, Resilient Wellness. So welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining uh, me today in this podcast. So there's a couple of things I just want to go back to in my experience in tech. I've been in tech for 20 years. I've been in some very global organizations uh, in sales and marketing. And I my last two gigs were at uh, Facebook and Google. And so what I saw there, as I've said uh, to some friends of mine, is that I see all the young people trying to come up and people of color and what they're experiencing is a barrier to hiring. And it's not just because of their tech skills, because they have those, they are contractors. And when we talk about contractors and you look at the majority of the folks that are contracting, they want to get into these companies. They have the skill set. They just don't have those elite degrees. They haven't the social uh, capital to get in there to these companies to really show their worth. And I feel that this is an injustice to a lot of those folks. And this podcast is for you because we see you. And hopefully we can give you some tips today that will enable you to become a stronger person and to use some techniques and resources that you can find that will help you to stand stronger in your place at work in tech, or if you are trying to slowly move out of that industry and where you may find your, not your passion, but find your calling and your purpose. So with that, I'm going to ask Nicole. Nicole, I know you've been in uh, a lot of uh, civic engagement as an activist. You've done a lot of work with the community. That, I mean, how we came together was at the um, the Business Women's Summit uh, one summer. Um, yeah, it was the uh, the Bay Area Women in Power Summit that uh, progressive leaders and civic engagement leaders put together uh, in the city of San Francisco. Shout out to uh, Mayor Lyndon Breed. Yes. And so that was a very exciting, I want to say, uh, summit. It brought lots of women together. But again, we were also talking in this circle of not, you know, addressing the civic rights of women of color. I think there was only one woman that brought that up, and that was about the rights of nannies and uh, workers, cleaners that go to your home and they do hours and hours and hours and they wouldn't get paid overtime and they would not have any benefits and so when they would ask for this overtime it would become I remember was it they were talking about the conflict like no we've set a certain rate for you in a certain amount of hours and then they would ask for more and more and more which took away from their family so they have rights they can say no this is my time but they didn't have these rights and as a nanny when you work as a nanny or as a uh if you're doing house cleaning there are certain rights that you don't have and so this is some of the areas that um 
I want to bring up with Nicole because Nicole has a lot of information about, you know, what she's done in the Bay Area and how she became involved in the civic engagement area. So, Nicole, can you speak a little bit about your civic engagement and uh, what you're doing today? I mean, I became involved uh, civically uh, when I was in high school. For my particular generation here in California, uh, in my high school life cycle, Governor Pete Wilson was the sitting governor, uh, a Republican, and the rhetoric that he was espousing and the bills that he was, you know, petitioning for, for uh, for the legislature and for the populace to pass Propositions 187 and 209, uh, really looked to undercut communities of color. 187 in particular, um, you know, as a young person, really, you know, affected my thinking in terms of how society viewed me. Uh, I am a American citizen, uh, but my background is Mexican American. And 187 in particular um, had language in this bill uh, that basically uh, said that if you were a undocumented immigrant, basic social services like health care, emergency health care could be denied to you. And, you know, when I heard about this as a child and I thought about it, um, you know, I realized that, wait a minute, if that meant that, you know, I was an athlete in high school and it meant to me, wait a minute, if I, if something happened to me, you know, I got hit by a car or, uh, you know, had a concussion or some was how, somehow, you know, uh, incapacitated where I didn't have verbal ability to prove that I was a citizen based solely on my skin tone, uh, you know, this bill would provide coverage uh, for, you know, medical first responders to not, you know, provide medical services to me. So, you know, is that level of awakening uh, that really has shaped my belief and philosophy of life, which is uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Damn. That's, <laughs> you're ready to get just eaten there. So I know. I, and how long ago was that, Nicole? How long, how long ago was that? I mean, you're really trying to age me here, but. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just saying, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're still fighting for the same shit that we need healthcare services for everybody and here we're talking about you know what's happening in the you know the tech community we need you know health care we need we just need basic health care benefits I mean, healthcare is a right, right? Healthcare shouldn't be well, tangled up. Well, to some up. people, I guess it's well, not. <laughs> but it shouldn't be tangled up in, you know, what you can afford. Um, so there's definitely, you know, a correlation there. Um, but, you know, it's history continues to repeat itself. And that's really, you know, as a student of history, you know, I specifically had a bet running about six months prior to uh, the last presidential election with uh, another friend of mine who uh, is, you know, deeply vested in, in civic engagement and politics. And he, you know, told me there's no way uh, the current president is going to win. And I said, you know, uh, no, actually, let's put $100 on it right now. Like, I'm actually pretty clear that the, this uh, person who's espousing these xenophobic uh, rhetoric and, you know, putting blame on communities of color is actually going to win. Right. I mean, America's America's racist. And, you know, a lot of folks want to sort of gloss over and cover over and not really recognize, uh, you know, the the history of America. But, you know, as I, I personally am and was not that surprised about the uh, shootings in El Paso, which is actually my uh, birth hometown. You know, words do matter. And, you know, when you vilify an entire community, uh, there's for sure people going to be out there uh, that feel in their minds righteous anger. But, you know, if we're having that level of discourse on a national level, of course it does trickle down into, you know, the tech community. Um, every community, you know, reflects uh, national trends, you know. So from my particular experience in the tech startup that I was a part of, considered a unicorn now, and what I didn't realize, you know, going into uh, this company was a lot more mon monolithic than what I had been led to believe. So I, you know, was interviewed by, uh, you know, two people of color and they very much aligned with who I was as a person. And then I got there and I was like, wait a minute, you're two people of color out of like five, five people out of a hundred uh, employees. And then, you know, I'm a woman's right 
activists and you know believe in equality for women and I recognized very quickly I was like wait a minute so there are about a hundred employees and 22 of them are women and unfortunately you know having those low numbers uh, you know ultimately ended up being represented in you know, how people talk to me, things that people said during all hands meetings, you know, one story in particular that really still just sticks with me and probably stick with me forever is, you know, one of the female and people of color advocates at this company, he himself was a, a person of color. He raised this question at an all hands meeting, at the all hands meeting, uh, photos of new employees were being shown and they were predominantly pale and male. And so, you know, this young man, you know, who will ever forever hold a place in my heart, he said, wait a minute, you know, we're hiring, you know, all of these new people. Where, where is the diversity? Where, where are the women? Where are the people of color? And uh, the then head of the operations at this company replied, well, you know, I don't believe in hiring women because you need to be, you need, you need, a, you need to be able to lift uh, 75 pounds to, you know, have these jobs. And, you know, women, women can't lift 75 pounds. And I, I was, I was gobsmacked, right? I mean, I see what it takes to be a woman. I see women, you know, single mothers lifting their children who are 75 pounds plus, right? So for him to have this way of thinking and to actually think, you know, this is actually an okay statement for me to make at an all hands meeting, uh, really blew my mind, but it was really sort of just, you know, Unfortunately, you know, he was part of the C-suite and, and nobody, nobody nobody called him out on it. Yeah. Um, so it was very reflective of the limited diversity of thought uh, at the leadership level. Wow. No, it's very typical. And so I want to bring Daisy into the conversation because I met Daisy and she was giving a presentation there on uh, actually – regarding this topic on tech and toxicity. But some of the things, Nicole, that you just said are actually things that are real and there are reasons why people don't call them out. And I'm gonna let Daisy introduce herself and to really speak to this because I think this is your area of expertise and, and tell us a little bit why of how you got into this. Yeah, like why, why you made this transition from where you were into you know, this resilient wellness. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Um, so I started doing a community organizing, civic engagement, advocacy. Um, as a teenager, young person, having experience like homelessness, systems involvement, etc. And after working in that space for uh, many years, I was just super like tired of the mismanagement of funds, the nepotism, the, the uh, savior mentality for our communities, dealing with racism and anti-blackness from other people of color, gatekeeping, et cetera. And I was like, you know what? This mainstream system is not gonna be able to even like do what our community needs. Mm -hmm. So why am I even here trying to like fight on the inside when I can, you know, be on the outside and also do work on the inside as well. So um, that's when I left to start my organization, Resilient Wellness, in terms of how do we focus, how do we, you know, raise awareness about the ways in which different systems um, organizations and institutions perpetuate intergenerational trauma for their constituents and their mm. staff um, and the communities that they're supposed to be serving and that they are embedded in. And I think why I say intergenerational trauma is because that's the biggest issue of our time right now. Intergenerational trauma on one hand for, you know, historically oppressed and disenfranchised communities that are constantly having to deal with like the legacy of what we've dealt with and we can't even, you know, recuperate ourselves long enough to, okay, well, how do we innovate? How do we thrive? Right. And then also on the other end, for those who, you know, their ancestors perpetuated these harms and they are reaping the benefits of mm -hmm. our communities being at a disadvantage and really having to bring that up in, in a way that's really meaningful that people get it because the language that's currently used around these different topics of like white supremacy, uh, Trumpism, some of the things, the inequities, it's very, very basic language. It's like, okay, this is stuff that we should already know just like going into, you know, middle school and high school that this is what's going on within the system, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, we have a bunch of people getting accolades and awards and speaking at conferences for saying the bare minimum. And they're not even bas like even like scratching the surface of what the problem is or how deep it is. So that's why I was like, OK, someone has to do it. Right. Um, and, <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> yeah. I've just been on this journey. It's, it's really interesting because me personally, I don't mince my words. As you know, I'm very direct and very clear. And people have a problem with that. There's a difference between being brutally honest, which, you know, sometimes can be an issue. And also just, you know, calling a spade a spade, say, calling 
something for what it is. And mm -hmm. I think we have a problem with that. We like to beat around the bush. We like to sugarcoat things. Um, and because sometimes we've been complicit because of our own internalized colonialism and our own internalized white supremacy and our own, you know, um, biases, we... Mm -hmm feel guilty when these things are brought up to us in a different type of way when we're giving a new perspective and i feel like that's one of the issues so do you think it's yes. because people there's that whole i don't want to ruffle feathers or i don't want to rock the boat and i don't want to sit you know make myself that person because let me tell you i have done that <laughs> so many times and i get singled out as Teresa is really, you know, she asks too many questions. You know, she is mm -hmm. just part of the team. She's not really taking on these big projects, which I have to say, I have always advocated for big projects and I have always taken on initiatives in bigger companies that nobody else wants to because I felt like as a woman, that's what I have to do to prove myself, yeah. right? I'm always proving myself and working hard and that's what we do. But it just tears you down internally because you see that uh, male energy in there and they're taking advantage of you because they know you want to work hard. Mm -hmm. They know that you're there and they're like, oh, yeah, let's just it's almost like, oh, we know we can get as much out of her because she wants this job and we can just pay her whatever because she's here yeah. and, and she's very thankful to be here. Right. It's like, oh, my God, I won this award, but I'm dying inside, you know, and it's it's this institutionalized, like you were talking about, oppression that they or misogyny that they just they're I don't know if they're just not aware or they just I, I can't put my finger on it. Exactly. Mm, no, they're pretty aware of it because, <laughs> I mean, if you ask them, do you want to be in this position? No, 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 I don't want to be. Why? Because they know what's going to be on the other side of that. They know the trials and tribulations and the harm and the trauma that's on the other side of being an oppressed person. Of course, they don't want to be in our shoes. They want to emulate, right, when it's convenient for them. But ultimately, no, they know what they're doing. And I think that's the issue, too. We, we keep trying to act like they don't know what they're doing. They're grown. We shouldn't have to facilitate constant workshops, conferences, whole entire institutions to teach you how to treat other people like human beings. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Right. Because even kids, ch children that come from oppressed communities, they even know better, right? right. So what is stopping well, now, you? Now there's more information out there for sure. That right. they, that, well, now because of social media, you know, and that how that's affecting it. But I mean, but that's the dirty little secret of Silicon Valley, right? I mean, these companies that are multi-billion dollar companies, you know, have workforces that are contract workers. Um, you know, Google in particular, it's come to light that Google's contract workforce is actually larger than their full-time employees. So now you have 10, you know, U.S. senators who wrote a letter to Google, uh, basically, you know, questioning this this practice and going back to the story that I shared earlier, you know, there's a lot of emotional labor being one of the only people of color, you know, in any in any space. And you know, the gentleman that was a true ally, uh, you know, not only to himself being a person of color, but to you know the women of this organization and, and the women that you know he's trying to bring into the organization. He was a contract worker, and he had been at this startup for a year and a half, and he ended up leaving because they. The company, this startup, this multi-billion, this billion-dollar valued unicorn, uh, wasn't willing to convert him as an employee. And I am very clear that I believe true, truly, deeply in my heart that uh, they never converted him because he did. He did stand up, you know. And my mm -hmm. own sort of experience, you know, being at this company, I started as a contract worker as well, and I saw what they did to him. And, you know, it became very clear to me that if they were going to do that to him, then I was essentially in the same boat. And, you know, the deal that they had struck with me was come on as a contract worker, you know, for very little pay, not what your market rate is at all. Um, and we'll convert you, you know, show us what you got and mm -hmm. we'll convert you yep. in two months. And two months turned into three, turned into four, turned into, well, you know, after, after we, you know, after this series, you know, we'll do it. And I, you know, I wasn't w willing to play that game. I saw what they did to, you know, my friend who had been there for a year and a half, and I was, I just didn't buy, um, you know, quite frankly, what I thought were lies. And, you know, one of the best things that I ever learned from working in the political sphere for, you know, the most powerful woman 
elected leader in the nation was know your worth, right? And so, you know, if things aren't working out, you know, sometimes, you know, definitely try to have that other job lined up. But, you know, sometimes you have to just walk away because you understand your worth. And if other people aren't going to understand your worth, then, you know, there's no value in you giving them, you know, your brilliance. Right. Yeah. And I want to add on that. I think it's the tactics that they use to keep people silent and complacent and keeping us assimilated is the fear tactics. And it's like what we call plantation politics. Okay, wow. well, that's what we call it. You have to call call it what it is because that's those are the same exact tactics that they used to keep other, you know, oppressed folks during slavery and colonialism to keep them in our place. We're going to take one of you who wants to rebel, who wants to organize, who wants to say no, who wants to stand up and show that you're a human. We're going to make an example out of them. We're going to destroy them in front of you, right? Using violence and whatnot. And that will make all of you sit down and be subdued wow and it's a it's a generational it's in our dna for some of us for a lot of us it's in our dna and that's why i'm really i'm more adamant about you know folks of color doing that healing work i'm um, breaking out of the assimilation um and the internalized racism politics and the obsession with fairness and whiteness because when we can do that work on ourselves we'll be more able and willing to stand up in the workplace and be like actually let's bound together and protect one another so that there's not just one person having to speak out and be the scapegoat Right. Right. And I want to give an example of something that recently happened that was super wild and it's still unfolding. One of the women, she works for a very prominent company in this DNI space, tech inclusion, workplace environment space. And she was like, wow, I'm doing this work. And I didn't even think about like my own internalized anti-blackness. Wait, she's in HR. She's in HR. <laughs> right. She was like, I didn't even think about the own ways I perpetuate some of these harms. And I'm out here doing this work. And I didn't even think about, like, I need to check my own stuff, do my mm. own healing work, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's a prerequisite for doing this work, right? And that is just like... This is constant though. You know, she was brave enough to even come up to me and tell me like in confidentiality, you know, Dixie, I need some help. Like, can you support me because I'm a, I'm over this large department and I need, you know, help in terms of, right? And I put this out on this listserv that I'm on. And this listserv is like comprised of all the folks who do like CSR, DEI. They run like the different ERGs. They do a lot of like the equity and diversity and recruiting those type of folks, right? Ellen Powell's on that listserv. Those type of folks are on this listserv. Wow. And I put out an email. I was like, um, and I, the subject line was the problem with DEI consultants. When I was talking about DEI consultants, I also mean like the program managers and all that. I kind of put them in the same category, like people who do DEI, right? And I, I told the story about what happened and I was like, you know, this woman came up to me and I think this was really enlightening. Like I would love to, you know, get a work group together so that we can develop some type of like tool uh, or framework for how do you vet DEI consultants and the uh, frameworks that they're using to do this work because a lot of the time it's one of two things they either pick you know white women who claim wokeness and know how to you know finagle the language of equity or they pick assimilated um, folks of color who still practice anti-blackness and horizontal violence to come and do the work because they know who they can control they know who's going to be able to bring that heat they know who's going to be complacent so i put the email out and i had heck of people like emailing me like departments people who are like dei head at, at cisco department of transportation from texas the head of diversity inclusion at apple they all reached out they were like yes this is a great idea like yeah heck yeah this is a huge issue like let's figure out how we can work on this and then here comes you know who um excuse me i don't think this is an appropriate conversation you are singling people out you're making people uncomfortable and then here comes another email on the list of about conduct code of conduct and behavior and language on, on the list are very punitive childish stuff that they used to do to us as kids of color in middle school and, and elementary school right when we would speak up about being abused or whatnot well we're going to develop a code of conduct so that it's just same thing that they did they did to elan omar um, when she started to speak up about like um, the, the Jewish influence in the whole Palestinian issue, they passed a law immediately about no anti-Semitism and this is how we conduct conversations. Why did we need to have that when we were having a very lively conversation, all kinds of people were jumping in, people who were heads and heads who had very substantial positions of power were like, yes, this is a real issue and going deeper, calling other people out. Um, they weren't calling other people out, but they were like, there's some people on this listserv who that's th what they do and they've been the ones getting all the contracts. And um, it was just really a sight to see how even those of us who claim to be well-meaning and yeah, we want to do DEI work, etc., are still a huge a part of the issue. Why are you trying to so silence us when right. we're having this conversation? It was a very lively conversation. It was very fruitful. It resulted in some very beautiful collaborations and meetings and things like that. Um, where was the harm caused? And the funny thing is, it was the only people who were complaining were white women. I'm just going to call it what it is. It was only white women who were complaining. Like all the, all the emails I got, the negative emails, it was only white women. Mm. 
Because they felt threatened? Threatened. I, why? I don't know. But honestly, that's not my problem. And I'm, I'm, I can't coddle you. It, you know, mm-hmm. you know, in a political climate where we have children dying oh, God. because yes. of this lack of having real candid conversations all these years. I made a video about this on my LinkedIn about how this type of behavior plantation politics is connected to what we are dealing with today. Well, we're in a political climate where you have children dying, right, in concentration camps, which is what that is. Um, I had someone tell me, I'm Jewish, and I, that's offensive that you would call those concentration camps. I'm like, that's what they are, right? Mm-hmm. When we have that type of political climate, we have children being ported into a school to prison or cradle to prison pipeline, mm-hmm. right? Uh, where we have all kinds of things happening, and this is what you choose to focus on. This is what you, you choose to get enraged about. It lets me know that not only are you completely unaware of what is happening and what is yet to come it shows me that you are not you've not done your internal work and you are in no way shape or form ready to do the work that you claim to do that you got hired to do that you are getting paid to do right and that's something that we as folks of color we need to start being really clear about because there's some of us who we're a part of the problem and we oh yeah they're a woke white person just because like they reposted a tweet about you know Kamala Harris running for office or something like that, like some small little act of like solidarity is like the height of resistance, right? <laughs> um, and, and it's it's some of us are folks who are part of this problem who, you know, created that environment, you know, just passing out these ally cookies and these ally badges, like it's nothing. It's like, no, you have to really show me that you've done the work because honestly, being a child, having to deal with very toxic dynamics from grown people as a child I you can't there's nothing that you can tell me like oh I'm an ally I've done my work because it's an energy that you possess right it's not what you say it's your energy and having dealt with that deep level of toxicity as a child there's nothing you can tell me because I've been dealing with you my whole life so I already know when you haven't done your work mm-hmm. I already know when you harbor different type of judgments and biases towards me as a person of color um and I, I think something else the triangulation that we were discussing in the workshop is, um, you know, I, 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 that's why I'm saying it's really more about like folks of color. I doing our work because we do contribute to this system staying the way it is. Because right now, even look about in the Bay Area, a lot of the folks who are in these different positions of power um, in these different tech companies, there are folks of color, right? And they're completely assimilated. Mm. So that's what you mean by the the triangulation that they just align themselves to. A white person that claims to be woke Mm -hmm. and then they're on their side and then they try to be the the friend to the person of color when they're actually working for the the woke person that is not of color correct that's one example another example could be when you have because colorism is a huge factor in this when you have a uh, proximity to whiteness because of your your skin tone mm. and you know that white folks automatically it does not matter if whatever culture you come from the lighter skin or skin tone that you are the more you get acceptance from them whether you're asian latin or um, southeast asian etc because anti-blackness is global you use the fact that you have that proximity and skin tone to collaborate with you know the person in a position of power to then enact harm right and trauma and stress onto other folks of color who are not in alignment with your assimilation Mm. that's another type of triangulation and i don't know if you folks all get out which is definitely a documentary um it's not (laughs) a movie it's a documentary Right. Or uh, Sorry to Bother You. Sorry to Bother You, oh which was also a really God. good documentary. I saw that and it just, I was scared. <laughs> yeah, I was like the horses. I was like, wait, hold right, on. Right, right. But it, it, it's, it, 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 it worked. It's, right. It worked. But I was still like, what the heck is going on? You saw there in those movies how they, it was a lot of white folks, but they would use other folks of color to triangulate right. with the uh, yes. works that they were doing. So that's why I'm like, I, I it's more, I, it's less about white folks doing their work because that's, you know, you're going to need some spiritual tools for right. that. I'm more focused on folks of color getting our stuff together. Right. It's really interesting, though, right? Because as you were saying, you know, there's faux allies, right? I mean, there was definitely somebody at this company who, quite frankly, passed, passed as white. I mean, if he hadn't acknowledged to me that he came from uh, a different ethnicity, I, w- I would have thought he was a white dude. And he definitely, you know had woke like you know beliefs but he was still a part of the machine in the system that was really oppressing uh the few people of color that were at this company and and mistreating them so you know that's that's the question and for me you know i don't even like the word ally anymore to me ally is like the very bare minimum what does that exactly mean oh you're gonna hold my hand and you know say oh i'm really sorry that somebody you know 
said that to you, that microaggression to you, or are you going to be an advocate, right? The gentleman that, you know, ultimately uh, ended up leaving because they didn't convert him, that's an advocate, right? He he stood up for what he believed was right at, you know, all hands and spoke his truth, you know, where it was clear that what was happening, uh, you know, to a lot of other people and, and they didn't say anything, you know, so sometimes you have to, I feel, you know, conflicted on, on both ends, right? I mean, I understand that once you quote unquote get in the door, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to stay in the door and you have bills to pay and, and whatnot. So, you know, it's, it's a sticky wicket that everybody, you know, I think folks in color really have to, to deal with. I mean, for a lot of the tech companies, you are the only person there and you are making pretty good money now. So, you know, where do you draw the line, you know, in terms of, you know, being still the only person in that room. But I mean, the first step to any revolution is education. So, you know, people need to be aware of an outrage over a problem uh, before we can do much about it. And clearly I feel, you know, we're getting to to that threshold, which, uh, you know, makes me really happy. I mean, everything that's super terrible right now in terms of the concentration camps, in terms of the, you know, mass murder of, the largest mass murder of Latinx people, you know, in the US, uh, which just happened recently. You know, it's really hard for me, you know, myself as a person of color to carry this emotional burden. And I just sort of the mantra that I tell myself is, you know, I know that this is awakening an entire generation of of activists because I've already lived it, right? I was already, you know, put in that sort of uh, you can be a victim uh, mindset when I was in high school with Prop 187, 209. And, you know, that was, you know, really my political awakening. And the funny thing is, is that whenever I talk to anybody who identifies as Latinx and is in, you know, a political space that is around my generation, and, you know, we start talking like, oh, you know, how come you got interested in politics like you know why are you in this space and everybody everybody has always said governor pete wilson so you know that's the one thing that i you know i can go to sleep at night uh knowing you know at least that history repeats itself and a whole generation uh of youth is going to be uh awakened yeah and i i so here's again you know bringing it around to tech because i think that when we talk about tech tech is influencing a lot of our communities big time it is a uh, they know that they know this, right? And yet we are still not influencing the product and how it will benefit us. Instead, it is controlling us. So from the inside, when you look at it and you see who's running, you know, this platform, I, I mean, come on, there's another great movie you need to see, <laughs> which blew my mind was The Great Hack, which is all about the Cambridge Analytica uh, debacle and Facebook and the, the election. And if you haven't not seen that movie, please watch that movie because it talks about how this platform and I was there, you know, when you talk when we're talking about all this toxicity and we're talking about, you know, the institutionalization and and the colonizing of the mind and the people and how they work, you know, they make it very fun and everybody wants to get in there. Right. And it's like a cool thing. But once you're there and you see what's really going on and, you know, it's all about advertising and money. It's all about money. And so when people say, oh, but, it, you know, it's like, no, people, this is, it, you know, Google is the same way. Google is the same way. So when we talk about, you know, the, the money that's being spent, you know, how people are portrayed and how we're trying to influence the these uh, large platforms, I feel there is a serious reason why we are not being allowed into these product discussions or into the VP uh, or even, you know, the C-level suite to influence these products because we're the ones using it. You know, we're the ones, you know, the, uh, there's a large population, people of color in our communities. I mean, we're all glued to our phones, you know, it's like, but what's being pumped out into our brains is definitely psychological based on what they know they have information on us and how they are working that system to infl- I mean, it is really crazy. I just think it should just overall just be a just flat out business platform for people just to do business on. It should not have anything 
with the the people sharing, you know, all their pictures and this and that or whatever. It should just be a business platform like for marketing. That's all it should be. But instead, it's got all this other information tied into it. So I guess what my point is, and I'm going around again, is that the tech population for people of color is very limited to get in. And when I'm there, it is not a pipeline issue. It is not a pipeline issue. It is they do not want you in my mind, to see what's really going on behind the curtain. Exactly. I welcome two snaps for that. I mean, you brought up the, that documentary, but I mean, everybody who's listening to this podcast and has an interest in this should read uh, Algorithms of Oppression. Oh yeah. Uh, You know, a book written by um, (laughs) Sophia Noble, right? And, you know, in the book, she really breaks it down. Uh, And, you know, I actually did this test last night just to see, I was like, well, this book came out a while back, you know, is this still true? And so she points out that, you know, black, uh, Uh, Americans are routinely left out of image search results uh, for terms like professional. Yet when you search three black teens, you get photos of mugshots. And so I actually went in last night just to double check. I was like, oh, is this still happening? And I put in professional. And, you know, it's your standard like white guy and a suit and some white women and maybe some light skinned people of color. And then I put in three black teens and there were the mugshots. And I was like, you know, when tech companies develop algorithms that automate, you know, the bias of uh, people from one demographic, you know, they're what they're essentially doing is automating uh, bias in general. Right. Um, you know, even the Library of Congress, quite frankly, had to be petitioned uh, by Latinx students as well as librarians to stop calling humans illegal, you know, in its classification system. I mean, when I was growing up, it was illegal aliens, right? Like, that's what people of color, particularly from the Latinx community, were called. Now, of course, you have a little bit of, you know, realization that that's the wrong thing to call other humans. And so, you you know, the correct term these days is a documented immigrant. But, you know, I, you know, I'm not that old. So it wasn't that long ago, quite frankly. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's something that we should really like start to understand that this is more insidious than we realize, because what that is right there, white supremacy is about othering, otherizing people, because when I can otherize you and turn you to anything less than a human, then it's easy for me to commit violence and murder on you. Because remember that person, they're not human. They're an illegal alien, right? They're an an undocumented, they're whatever you want to call them for today. They're thugs, et cetera. And when I start to embed that into the minds of the masses, then they also will start to develop my lens and start to view those folks as less than human. But something too in that, which why I said is um, the trauma on both sides, is there's a really good book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it talks about, well, Paulo Freire says, well, when you oppress other people, when you dehumanize other people, you dehumanize yourself, right? So this issue that we're talking about, the lack of empathy, uh, uh, the apathy, you know, issue, etc., we have to realize that a lot of these folks, they don't see our communities as human. They don't see our pain. They don't see our suffering. They can't. They can't empathize with us. They can't put themselves in our shoes. They don't know what it feels like. That's why when you're saying they don't want us in those product and tech conversations, no, they don't because they don't want someone coming in and saying, hey, actually, that's going to destroy our community. Hey, I'm going to go be a whistleblower. I'm going to go tell about what this product mm-hmm. that you're creating, mm-hmm. right? They don't want that because they want to be able to keep on with their plans of dominating our communities and just using us as a way to generate revenue because we're the largest consumer base. Right. Right marginalized people right there's even something called the poverty tax where things actually cost more in the hood why is that yeah yeah yes. no you're it's very expensive to be poor exactly. in america very expensive um i love that you you brought up that book because you know Toni morrison passed away recently and one of my favorite quotes that she ever said was you know if you can only be tall because someone's on their knees then you have a serious problem and for me i was like well there you go that's not only all of america but you know even when you boil it down into um different industries where you know they're Majority, two pale, two male. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this, I love this conversation that we're having, and this is why I I wanted to start this podcast. But I know a lot of people out there that are listening, they're like, oh, you know, those women just sound angry and bitter and, you know, they're having uh, maybe something happened with them because that's how people want to perceive us when we're explaining our rage and finally, you know, what we've seen and people think that we're just making these things up. Uh, it's like, no, they're just bitter. They got dumped or they got whatever. It's like we're we're pissed off and, and they're just radicalized. And, Which you is, know, but but there's facts. There's facts and data. I mean, if right. California is a majority. Who looks up data, though? California, Everybody's stuck their face in their phone. California right? is a majority minority state. 
And right now, the majority of black and Latinx workers in tech are in blue collar jobs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they make up 10% of Silicon Valley's direct tech workforce. Yep. 26% of the white collar contract workforce and 58% of the blue collar contract workforce. I mean, I had this discussion with three Bay Area mayors and my frustration was, you know, they were parroting this pipeline problem and Right. I, you know, stood up at this conference and I said, it is not, it is no longer a pipeline problem. These FANG companies, the majority of these companies in the Valley, uh, you know, they're way beyond just hiring and having one engineering department. There are government relations departments, there are marketing and communications departments, uh, you know, public affairs, operations, many, many things. Research. And yeah, exactly. And for, you know, uh, the actual full-time benefited employees to be 10% of Silicon Valley's tech workforce. Right. It's it's not a pipeline problem. It's it's, you know, it's quite frankly it's disgusting. It's economic disenfranchisement, oh, right? It because is. this is the thing. If I don't want to hire you in the most predominant like workforce right now in the world, right? And I know that you're going to take that wealth back to your community, probably yep. circulate it within your community. That stops you from being able to build generational wealth, which can lead to self-sufficiency exactly. for your That's and that's why when we talk about this DEI conversation, yep. I automatically, you know, who's just talking and talking just to talk and who's actually like really about that life because this is the angle that you have to understand it from. All of it is about disenfranchisement and and um, systemic oppression and how do we keep these communities groveling and at the tip of our fingertips um, at the uh, at the beck and call of what we need right right and I think something else too that we should also be looking at is for because you named out some of these statistics okay we also know that tech is looking to automate jobs right so I want to talk about you know conversation that w- that's being had right now so I'm on the policy um council for plan 2040 which is a regional plan that was instituted by the state of California awesome. for the nine bay area counties and it's like trying transportation and housing for the next 25 years. So where's all the housing going to go? How transportation is going to run? All of that. And with that, what about workforce development, right? And they, we had like to have a meeting about um, automated uh, vehicles and job automation. And you know what some one guy was saying? He was like, well, you know, these are going to be really good inventions because imagine so many people, they won't have to work anymore and they can spend their time doing other things. And I'm just like, (laughs) wait, hold on. You missed the whole entire like part where people actually need money to survive, especially in the Bay Area. But this is how they're thinking like right. this very deep I'm going to use this word very sociopathic and narcissistic mm-hmm. and delusional type of thinking mm-hmm. it's very delusional mm-hmm. right and they don't see like you know you're talking about automating jobs for predominantly black and brown folks and we already know that loss of jobs is connected to domestic violence cases mm-hmm. it's connected to CPS cases within a community it's also connected to all kinds of other statistics right so why aren't we holding these tech companies accountable on both ends for making sure that their contract workers which are predominantly folks of color are getting benefits and better contracts and are protected when they get into the workplace and also too that okay we're going to be automating jobs for whole classes of people driving jobs restaurant jobs right delivery jobs warehouse jobs warehouse jobs is Amazon is I don't know if you've seen it recently but Amazon they're always on the hook for the warehouse but just because they're going to raise their minimum wage to $15 those people in those warehouses they don't get bathroom breaks they're starting to automate things that are taking away because they're like, well, they're just complaining. So we're just going to start automating. And these are in communities where that's the job. They build these warehouses to create jobs, but now they're going to take them away. And this is the thing. The equation is always going to be the same, no matter what sector, whether it's from politics, because I was in there too, knee deep. And a lot of these folks running around the community talking about I'm an empowered woman and I'm, mm, mm, there's some stuff to talk about. That's another story. <laughs> That's but, another podcast. <laughs> oh, the, the, the formula is always ex- the same. It's exploitation experimentation right and exclusion that's always the name of the game when you're dealing with the white supremacist system and once we can really wrap our heads around that we'll be ahead of the game because we can already see what they're going to plan years uh, you know down the line like now they were talking about some um that they're 
they're taking people to space and oh, they have all yes. SpaceX and all these yeah. things. So you mean to tell me y'all done broke down the planet. Right. Destroy <laughs> took away the indigenous frameworks and philosophies that can actually help the planet be healthy. Instituted um mass farming and all these kind of different destructive things for the environment, fracking, whatever. And now you want to go to the moon and leave us here to deal with this? <laughs> Tri- right. Trifling. Right, right. I know. It's like the movie though, Elysium, right? <laughs> yes, I, I saw yeah. that and I was like, well, I don't know why they made Matt Damon the star of the show. When it would probably be a black dude. I mean, let's be real about this. Um, but I love that you brought right? up uh, you know, transit. It's so true. Um <laughs> You know, I, I've just been thinking a lot. Of, I, obviously, I came out of the, the micro mobility space. And so, you know, I've dealt with transit policy. And what's been really interesting to me with the most recent IPOs is, you know, this I, transit privatization. What mm-hmm. it's really created is a commuter caste system, right? Where wealthy can spend $20 on a ride hail system while, you know, poor people have to rely on, on mass transit. But what has now come out more and more in data is these right health systems are, you know, cutting the knees of, of mass transit. And so are, you know, micro mobility companies are cutting the knees off, uh, you know, uh, mass transit. And the sad thing, you know, particularly here in the Bay Area is there has been a large exodus of communities of color, uh, you know, here in the Bay uh, due to affordability issues. And so now, you know, who's paying the most to try to come in to, to go to, you know, where the job center is, which is, you know, really San Francisco, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're coming from further and further away uh, and paying more and more and more, you know, money. I mean, BART is, BART was never made, BART was never a system made for, you know, the poor blue collar working class. It was always a white collar uh, transit system. It's why actually BART has, you know, upholstery covered seats because the idea was always, it was going to be, you know, pricey, but at a price level that white collar suburbia workers were willing uh, to pay. So it's really interesting to me how that system has flipped. And I do want to point out one thing, you know, that's really frustrated me as well is if Silicon Valley is the current, you know, quote unquote, you know, generational wealth building mechanism, right? It's the gold rush of it is our lives. Mm-hmm. And if we're syst- like uh, Daisy said, we're systematically cut out of it, then, you know, it's, you know, eons of generational wealth that that we're being robbed of. And I just go back to my history textbooks. I'm like, it's exactly what actually happened during the gold rush. So during the gold rush, you know, in the 1800s here in California, uh, they instituted what was called a miners tax. And a miners tax was basically aimed at the uh, AAPI, the Asian Pacific Islander populace and the Latinx populace who knew how to mine already, right? Mexico has been had been mining silver for generations. So when the gold rush hit, you had all of these uh, Mexican miners who actually knew what they were doing come to California to try to, you know, quote, strike it rich. And so uh, the government said, no, nah, not today. And they instituted this miners tax which basically said that if you were foreign born, you had to pay this incredible levy on any of the wealth that you mined, which essentially cut this entire populace out of this ability to, you know, create wealth for their families because the tax was so high, there was no point in even trying to mine because more than half of what you mined was going to go to the government. And so it's the same, you know, historical lens that I always take a look at when I look at uh, Silicon Valley and the tech community um, is, you know, they're robbing, you know, what these companies are doing are essentially robbing you know, these generational, gener- wealth. generational wealth. Exactly. Um, but, you know, that is a, you had mentioned, you know, let's think about folks that are solutions. And what's interesting to me is that um, Pager Duty is this company that I got interested in because the CEO is Latina. Her name is Jen Tejada. And I caught her on some VC news channel. And she said something to the question from the reporter was, well, you know, you have the, you know, the greatest DNI. Uh, at your company right now, like, how did that happen? And Jen sort of like laughed and she said, you know, it's it's work, right? But we we want our company to reflect tomorrow, not yesterday. And I thought that that was really insightful. And, you know, when they IPO'd, they actually IPO'd this year as well. And they're doing quite well on, on, the, on the stock market because what people, I know that, you know, this morality, this sort of softy feely, oh, you know, your company should reflect the diversity of America. Business leaders don't give two pins about that. But the reality (laughs) is, you know, when you actually look at profits 
Um, you can. There are plenty of data sets now uh, that show that when you have a company that is diverse, not only in terms of women but in ethnicity, you know, you're 33% more likely to see better than average profits, right? Companies that are diverse hold twice as many patents than companies, you know, who reflect only, you know, one monolithic ethnicity. Um, so, you know, it comes down to, you know, do you want to make money? Well, if you want to make money, uh, recognize that, you know, 44% of Gen Z is multicultural and, you know, they're growing up in a time where they're going to expect to see themselves in any, you know, brand marketing that you do. And the only way that you're going to get culturally sensitive brand marketing is by hiring people that actually look like the people that you're trying to reach. Right. So Daisy, I know that you do your kind of wellness coaching and a lot of education in the tech space for uh, folks that have experienced the trauma or that have maybe have some courses or they come to you for education, right? Because you have the experience of setting up some, I want to say solutions, right? But one of the things that you brought up and I want to get back to you, Daisy, and what you, you, how you structure that and why you feel it's important and what we need to do as a, as a group collectively, because I could say right now, you know what, if everybody in the services industry in the Silicon Valley and everybody just like walked out, you know, I think the stock market would just seriously crash. <laughs> the stock market would just go down. Everybody would just be in a shithole because <laughs> they rely on us. We do all the work. We do all the work. And one of the things that people don't recognize is people of color, we are doing twice as much work. We do twice as much uh, education and work together. And we're always taking care of other people in our communities. So I don't understand how that's not attributed in some collective way to these companies that this is what would make, like to Nicole's point, them more money. It would be beneficial for everyone. Is that, I mean, am I just talking utopia here that people just don't, I mean, is that what it is? It's like, oh, that'll never happen, but it needs to happen. Otherwise I see, you know, everybody, if they just stood up and said, I'm not taking this shit anymore. I'm not going to go in. Just like me, I decided I'm out. I'm doing this podcast. I want to start lifting women and people of color up. And it, you know, if everybody left and did that, the stock market would crash. It would. Or people just like, you know, why don't we all just coordinate to not work? Like we could still get come come to work, get paid, but we all just coordinate to not work. So no one can singularly singularly get blacklisted. And it needs to be white folks putting themselves on the front line because they're gonna be the ones who are gonna be forgiven the most, right? Um, but for me personally, I think when especially when we're talking about like the whole um anger piece and, and doing the work and trying to find solutions and strategies. Um, it's hard for us to implement the solutions that we know are going to work because they run, run people the wrong way. Oh, it's, too, it's just too radical. Oh, you know what? That's just too much. It, you're, you're, you're too angry. Um, yeah, why is that? I we're mean, always too angry. Why? We're not angry. Matter of fact, <laughs> I'm one of the most goofiest people, as you saw from my, my presentation. <laughs> I love humor. I feel like humor is like a really powerful tool for healing and connecting with other people. Mm -hmm. And plus, I'm a Leo. We're just like very exuberant that way. But <laughs> something that I've noticed that folks like to use is they like to use, oh, you're angry as a way to mm -hmm. discredit what you're saying. Mm. Whereas actually, shouldn't that make it even more valid what I'm saying? Because there's even more energy and passion behind what I'm talking about. That's giving you the impression that I am angry. And I think, you know, that's always used as a way to discredit people and their intellectual capabilities because... You know, I can be angry as heck, still keep a very even tone and still kind of like drag you to filth with very big intellectual like, you know, jargon, you know. <laughs> so it's like that's the skill that we've had to learn because it's like, OK, I try to tell it to you straight. That doesn't work. I try to tell you nice. That doesn't work. It's like, but also something too you have to realize is most of the society is desensitized. Mm. They're so desensitized because all they care about is Netflix. All they care about <laughs> is processed foods, which desensitizes your nervous system, right? Mm. So you can't really even feel your own feelings about things. And also too, a lot of folks are overwhelmed just by the political climate that right. before we even had this presidency, now it's even more of a bigger reason to check. Well, it's, it's done, right? From right. here. So it's like, you know, when you deal with all those different factors, 
years on top of the generational trauma that's in our DNA, it's like you're dealing with the recipe for complacency. Mm. You know, that's why I really focus on doing the healing work because when you can start to do that healing work on an energetic level, which we talked about, Mm -hmm. right? You can start to reverse some of those effects so that you can come back fully into your humanity and realize, you know what? There ain't no such thing as neutrality in this situation. And me being desensitized, I felt like I had a choice on what side I was going to, you know, be able to stand on. Where actually you really kind of don't, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we are going to carry the consequences and the karma for just sitting and watching all these things happen. But if you're doing something, if you're sharing articles, if you're sharing, you know, uh, spreadsheets of all the different companies that are a part of the whole craziness happening at the border, if mm-hmm. you're, you know, exposing folks, right. all of that, it's like you're being smiled upon, you know, by... I believe in my own cosmology and my indigenous cosmology that the ancestors are smiling down on you for doing the work and, you know, appeasing them for the pain and suffering and the hell that they had to go through. You know, I I can't sit. That's why I'm so like out about the work, because I can't sit knowing what my ancestors had to go through, knowing what other other folks ancestors had to go through trail of tears, you know, Mm -hmm. being pushed out of their own land, you know, um, NAFTA, NAFTA, all these broken economic treaties, slavery, et cetera. I can't sit and understand that history and not do something. I'm betraying myself, I'm betraying my ancestors, I'm betraying my future generations. That's how deep the work is. And once people are able to really solidify themselves in that framework, this switch will flip very quickly. But because we don't understand it as that serious, as such, as a, as a threat to our survival as people, right? It's just like, oh, well, let's go advocate and let's send emails and let's do a workshop and let's have a happy hour where, you know, we give black and brown people fried chicken and Moscato and that should appease you. <laughs> you know, stop asking for more. Right. It's like now you're being greedy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, we're doing this for you. So, you know, get off our back. It's like, no, you know, you're on our fucking backs. You're okay. On our backs. Yeah. And, so. I'm, and I'm mad because my ancestors are in my bloodline. They're pissed and they want to be a piece. So yeah, I'm angry. I'm sorry. I got hundreds of people in my bloodline that y'all didn't abused, maimed, did whatever to. Yeah. They're going to be pissed. Right. Yeah. They kind of have like their lives fucked up for generations <laughs> on, on generations. So yeah, no, it's a, uh, I, I think it's almost an irony of how the political climate and, you know, Trump is really, you know, this whole woke, we're all becoming more woke and we're getting, you know, we're all talking, but at the same time, we might be woke from the television, but we're still sitting on our asses. So (laughs) I, I hate that word woke. I don't use that. It's not, it's like woke about what? Yeah, well, some of us have been woke for for decades. Okay, um, you know. born, born awake and like, can I go to sleep? Actually, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? I mean, you definitely have to invest in you know a community of courage. If if this is if you're you know do do the the personal work that you know Daisy does, but you know one of the things that you have to do is invest in your community of courage and have the right friends and people who care about you unconditionally um, and. Invest in your invest in your in your mental health. I Absolutely. Mean, one of the things that I I do see the tide shifting. I mean, that's what makes me really happy is I, I see the political shift moving more towards a, a populist nature. Um, you know, one of the things that I did want to uh, raise up in terms of things that are changing, which can be helpful, is Assembly Bill Number Five. So the basic idea for this bill um, is that at work we should expect uh, a safe and healthy workplace to make enough to live and thrive and have a say over our working conditions. And there's laws regulating the workplace uh, that provide the basic foundation for our rights on the job and make clear that employers have to follow the rules. So AB5, which is uh, Assembly Bill Number 5, authored by my fellow Chingona Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, uh, would help ensure that this basic foundation of rights and protections applies to most workers across the state. So AB5 would make clear that most workers are employees covered by the many protections of workplace laws rather than independent contractors who, you know, don't have those protections. Uh, A true independent contractor is someone who runs her own separate business, sets her own rates, and builds a customer base and takes on the risk of business failures. And there are plenty of industries right now, including Silicon Valley, where they like to call the people that are working for them independent contractors. But the reality is, is that they would fail that uh, A-B test you know, which was set in stone by the California bipartisan, both Republicans and Democrats, bipartisan Supreme Court. So Mm. that bill is moving now to the Senate. August recess for the California legislature is almost over. So, you know, if you want to be woke, (laughs) pick up the phone and call your state senator and tell them, you know, I expect you to uh, pass uh, Assembly Bill number five. 
Yeah, we need these bills passed. And again, as we've said before in a couple of other discussions that we've held, is that your biggest power is to vote. You have to vote. I mean, I think we brought up the stats in the last uh, discussion, Nicole, between you and I. Over 50% of white people go out and vote. And you know, when you bring people of color together, they don't even make up that percentage in the last elections. So this is your time. If you do anything, please, you have to vote this this coming election. It is so important. Yes. And I'm going to play devil's advocate. And, you know, I come from the whole world of like civic engagement, mm-hmm. boards and commissions, working in the city and doing all these other crazy things in politics. I feel like the most power that we have is on the local and state level. Mm hmm. Federal, I feel like it's done. I, I say that because, okay, we can have this whole election where you have all these different Democrats trying to run for office, et cetera, um, who are very questionable even themselves. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, too, doesn't the Electoral College still make the final decision at the end of the day? Yeah, we have the popular vote. I'm not telling people to not go vote. And at the same time, too, how do we identify the individuals who are part of the Electoral College and get them to commit to not voting Trump in? Because at the end of the day, the Electoral College makes the final decision. And I and I don't understand all the different political folks in my space that I have this conversation with. They always like kind of like beat around that fact. I was having a conversation with my friend the other day and I was like, wait, but doesn't the Electoral College at the end of the day? Yeah, but the popular... Okay, but what about the Electoral College? Yeah, but the popular... But what about the Electoral College? Who are those people? What are their political allegiances? What are their businesses' allegiances? Let's start to expose them so that we don't have to deal with what we did with dealt with last time. Because I think another thing that's kind of distracting from the um, homegrown white supremacy that we have here is, oh, Russia and their involvement in the 20-something election. And Okay, at the end of the day, Russia could have done... What, they could have turned took the whole Facebook and turned it inside out. If they wanted to, right? All of our profiles. Right, they could have done that. And at the same exact time, at the end of the day, isn't it not the Electoral College that makes the decision? I feel like a lot of folks, they underestimate. They underestimate how much power we don't have on that federal level. They but, already have things set in motion. But you're talking about one race. So I'm yeah. going to push back on what you, you're saying. I, I encourage everybody to go out and vote and to use their voice. Uh, when we're talking about the Electoral College, we're talking about one race. That's the presidential race. You know what? The president doesn't write legislation. So, you know, I'm not I'm not out telling people, you know, and advocating for them to vote. And I'm not out there registering people to vote on the level that I do, you know, talking about, oh, so that you can go vote for president. No, I'm out there talking about we need to flip the Senate, right? We need to flip the Senate and uh, your local electeds really matter. And it's about building a but pipeline. that's what I just said, yeah, though. She it's was about just building a pipeline mm-hmm. of communities of color. Well, I just want to, you know, to emphasize when we're advocating for folks who register and vote, do not just think about the presidential race. Yes, the Electoral College is problematic, but that's a shiny little firecracker. You know, what the races that everybody should be looking at are, you know, school board, water board in Central Valley, you know, your local uh, state uh, council member, your uh, county supervisor, who's running for sheriff, right? Who's running for DA? Or is this DA, you know, bringing a decarceral uh, platform? Or is this DA, you know, talking about, uh, you know, uh, let's lock up some more people uh, for three strikes and these misdemeanors of drug possession. Um, you know, those are the races that that really matter. And so, you know, definitely, uh, you know, vote.org uh, is a great website where you can check your voter registration uh, and register to vote uh, online. Mm-hmm. That's Thanks for clarifying that, Nicole. Yeah. So that was awesome. You guys are both on the same page on the local and flipping that. But again, yeah, the, the difference between the electoral and you know, yeah, because a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I got to register to vote for the president when no, it does. You got to come down to, you know, your community level Local and state is where it's y- really at. Awesome. Well, ladies, I think this has been a lot of information. I hope everybody out there, their ears didn't uh, fry off. But if they did, that's a good thing, because uh, you need to uh, be aware of, of, you know, these educated and awesome women. And there's many of you out there, which I hope to get to talk with you on this podcast and I know that uh, Daisy here, she's uh, doing your, um, what is, could you please tell me again that uh, the reform that you're doing, the 2040? Yes, um, Plan Bay Area 2040. Okay, Plan yes. Bay Area 2040. So that's Daisy's uh, new adventure, I guess, into equity. Is um, that, would you say that? 
I would say it's like my new thing, like policy thing. I'm also on the public health commission too. So even though I'm in tech and have a startup, I'm still very much in that world. Mm-hmm. We didn't get to talk about your tech company, but we, you know, we can talk about it some other time. But Nicole also, she's, uh, she has been my, uh, I want to say my fact checker, my, my right hand here and all these stats. She knows our numbers. So I really appreciate that. And so just I want to close out here on this podcast because this has been a great talk. But is there anything that uh, you guys would like to end with here? Because I could end with a lot of different things like, um, you know, something corny. But I'm going to let you guys close it out on what you want to say in this podcast. I mean, my summation is uh, be at the table, not on the menu and know your worth. Nice. Daisy? Just decolonize everything decolonize yeah decolonize the bloom right so you can be you can bloom right because i feel like we're just like smashed down and it's like once you open it's like you're like a seed and you can grow again so all right ladies well thank you for your time today this was awesome and uh there's going to be more to come and so for all you latinas out there and you uh wonderful women and folks of color in the communities that are listening and supporting us again you can find us on all the distribution platforms the apple uh, podcast google podcast spotify and also Stitcher. So stay tuned for more Latinas from the block to the boardroom and the topics that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. Thanks again. Have a great day.